Hello, welcome. Uh, we'll wait a second or so while folks uh, jump in for the last uh, wrap-up panel from uh, our entire uh, month of talking about supply chain and additive technology here at Mark Forged. So we'll just we'll just give everyone another minute or so to jump in uh, before we begin. We've got a great panel and lineup today. I'm very excited to talk about this topic. And uh, we've gotten a bunch of questions already uh, from, from all of you out there. So uh, thank you so much for that. And uh, during the course of this uh, event today, uh, feel free to ask more questions using the uh, Q&A function that uh, Zoom provides. We'd uh, love to have a conversation with you really about what, whatever uh, you're thinking about and whatever questions you might have on this topic. Uh, our agenda today, we're gonna take, uh, we're gonna get a chance to meet a whole bunch of the folks here at Mark Forge that, uh, that make uh, our additive platform uh, that work with customers that help manage our supply chain. So it's an awesome opportunity to meet some of the folks behind the scenes. Um, we'll give a quick overview of, of what it is that we actually do here at Mark Forged. Uh, we'll take a look at some actual customer examples uh, solving uh, supply chain issues. We'll talk about uh, what's going on with supply chain impacts over the last uh, four, five, six months that we've been watching and also how those trends layer into some of the, the larger trends around uh, supply chain uh, optimization and consolidation. And, uh, and then we'll leave plenty of time for, for questions and answers. So again, please, uh, if you have additional questions that you haven't submitted yet, uh, please send those through on Zoom and we will, uh, we will answer those uh, where we can. Uh, so I first want to uh, introduce this awesome panel of folks that are here with me today. Um, and uh, we'll get a little bit of background. So my name is Michael Papish. I'm the VP of Marketing here. Uh, we have Ted Plummer, who's a principal product manager and who works on our software. Uh, and uh, Ted, would you just uh, say hello? Hey, everybody. Excited to be here and talk about uh, the software platform at MarkForged. Awesome. Uh, we have Tom Mascalo, who's our principal product manager for our composites uh, and hardware lineup. Uh, hey, Tom. Hey, everyone. <clears throat> Uh, Trip, we have Trip Bird, who's on our strategic applications team in the Americas, uh, works closely with our customers. Hey, Trip. Thanks for the intro. Awesome. Uh, we got Jem Drew, who's an applications engineer manager out in Europe, uh, who can talk about some of the things going out uh, there with our customers. Hey, Jem. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Awesome. And, uh, and we have Adam Lapino, uh, who is our uh, director of uh, supply chains. And actually, Adam, uh, since this topic <laughs> is is all about uh, supply chain. Uh, maybe you could just give us a little background on on some of the stuff that you work on here at Mark Forged uh, before we kind of jump in a little bit later to hear about uh, some of the specifics on the topic. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, pleasure to spend some time with you today. Um, where, we, where we define supply chain currently is we're spending a lot of time in, in the fo different focus areas, <clears throat> but mainly right now where the biggest opportunities are, are around um, demand and supply, forecasting, um, material planning, uh, logistics and final mile delivery, and uh, really beginning to dig into the sourcing from the strategic side and ultimately the procurement side as well, um, just to, to name a few of the areas that we're, we're kind of digging our fingers into. That's awesome. Uh, thank you very much, Adam. So um, we want to start just by quickly going over sort of the supply chain landscape and really the way that we've been viewing this topic and thinking about the intersection with additive manufacturing. So we know that conventional supply chains can weigh us down. Um, they can be cumbersome and they can often make it slow and expensive when we need to get unique parts. Um, and specifically, we're thinking here around prototypes and tools, uh, MRO and spares, and low volume production. The kind of six stages of our uh, supply chain involve manufacturing, distribu distribution, regional hubs, regional shipping, and then uh, finally our point of need. And really the trick here is to figure out how to get uh, our parts across this entire supply chain in a fast and efficient way so that we can respond to the actual demand that we're seeing. So here's a, a nice little picture of, uh, of kind of how we've been thinking about supply chains and the different parts of them. Um, one of the things that I want to point out is when we think about sort of these shifts in industrial technology, um, you know, I think one of the things that we believe is that additive has the ability, uh, along with other digital distribution and uh, digital manufacturing technologies, to really completely disrupt and change the way that we manufacture. 
And these types of large waves of, of change have happened in the past a couple of times. And so I want to just show some data from one of the last industrial revolutions around the electrification of factories. And really, the thing I want to point out here is that the, the gap between when a new technology like additive is invented, or in this case, electricity, to when it's actually adopted in industrial settings takes a while. Um, we have to learn how to use this technology. We have to change the way that we optimize our workflows and really the way that we as humans actually perform our jobs. And you can see that back uh, at the this sort of last industrial revolution, that really the tipping point came in about 1919 or 1920, about 40 years after the invention of electricity. And that's when we saw these massive uh, leaps and gains in productivity. Um, this occurred right at the tipping point uh, after the, the pandemic of 1918. And so while we don't want to claim that you know pandemics cause industrial revolutions, really, I think what we see is these moments in human history when massive disruption washes over the way that we operate, um, change often, often happens and they're, they're a moment of change. So we're kind of marking this moment here today and sort of the last uh, couple months that we've been living through as a potential inflection point really in the adoption of these technologies and really for manufacturers rethinking the ways that they optimize and invest in their supply chains. So this is a very interesting point in time that we're living in. Um, and, you know, again, it's very hard to call a tipping point when you're in the middle of it. But I think through the course of the last uh, five, five or six weeks of these conversations we've had with a variety of, of customers and manufacturers around the globe, I think we're all beginning to see that something is happening. And we're very excited uh, to sort of wonder what comes next, how these technologies are used. And over the course of today's discussion, we'll have multiple different vantage points from across the Mark Forged uh, company and operations as to how these trends are playing out. Um, again, if you're not familiar uh, with Mark Forge previously, um, we make the Digital Forge, which is an industrial uh, 3D printing platform, consists of uh, printers, software, and materials that all work together. Uh, and we have the ability uh, through this platform to print in both uh, uh, plastic, reinforced carbon fiber, and metal, uh, all from a single workflow and single software system. Uh, today, we have the world's largest fleet of, conducted indu uh, of connected industrial printers across the globe, with over 12,000 printers operating in over 73 countries, uh, and we've printed over 10 million parts. And really, the way that this platform operates is that the more that it prints, the smarter that it gets and the better that the parts become. So really, we've been leveraging the insights, information, and data that has been generated by this fleet to help answer the questions we're talking about today. And really, what we're talking about when we talk about supply chain, which is just a, a fancy word for uh, the, the sum of all the activities it takes to uh, gather the parts you need to make the stuff that you manufacture. And really, we believe that by creating a smarter way of building parts, we can actually help manufacturers transform uh, their businesses by operating faster, uh, being more agile, and being more resilient towards the dynamic world that we live in today. Um, this is an overview of kind of how the, uh, how the platform uh, operates from an architecture perspective. I want to turn over to Ted, uh, who's our principal product manager for software, to walk us through some of the capabilities and really how this digital system can help map uh, onto the problems that we face today as manufacturers. Great. Thank you, Michael. So the MarkForge software platform, it powers distributed manufacturing and it's secure by default. Back in 2013, MarkForge invented the first cloud-first uh, software platform to power industrial 3D printing. And since then, we've been adding features, functionality, and capability to help end users get the most leverage and value out of their fleets. With our Iger platform, you can manage your fleet from anywhere in the world with an internet connection, print parts when you need them, where you need them, using different reinforcement and machine learning techniques, using the data that our platform is generating, we're able to print and learn and print and learn and continuously make our printers, our process, and ultimately your parts better as, as we scale. We will natively integrate with digital workflows and IT business systems so that you can use Iger to manage your fleet, to prepare and slice your parts, to have that digital repository, but then also plug it into other systems like in ERP or PLM or, or whatever, what have you, um, to really optimize your business and, and have the software platform work for you and solve problems that you need to solve effectively. 
We release continuous software improvements, new features via over-the-air upgrades. This large digitally connected fleet is able to do things like when new materials are released, have that capability pushed to you via a software update. When we do things like double the speed of our, our printers that goes out through a software update, uh, the day you buy it, it's only going to get better. And we have a commitment to always uh, bringing those features back to the entire fleet. And it's designed to scale. Using Iger, the establishing a digital inventory of parts, you can start to reinforce learnings and best practices within your organization and network out that added design for additive mindset, show people what has worked, show people how to make parts better, share, talk about, and learn together as an organization and get that improvement and really optimize the value that you pull out of the system. It's not just a printer, it's the, it's the platform and the ability to inter interface with that platform uh, from anywhere. Go next. And all of this is powered by powered on top of a secure platform. At MarkForge, we take security uh, very close to heart. It's first and foremost among the things that we do. And we have an approach to, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we have a multi-tiered approach and a dedicated security team to ensure that our customer data, your data, our own data uh, is always protected and always is following best industry best practices. This is not just a secure software application, it's a secure platform, it's human security at the MarkForge side, making sure that we have you know, badge access into our buildings, that we're controlling all the tools and infrastructure that we use. It's building on top of secure platforms like AWS using two-factor authentication, secure um, encryption, uh, and all of that accumulates into us being the first and only additive manufacturing manufacturer to be ISO 27001 certified. Uh, this is an independent audit that we go through uh, to ensure that our policies, processes, software, and systems are in compliance with the best-in-class uh, security uh, policies, and it's a regular audit that we go through, as well as uh, penetration testing and a whole uh, other range of, of uh, attestations and certifications to ensure that we can not only tell you that we are secure, but demonstrate to you that we are secure. And uh, I could spend a lot of time talking about this. There's a ton more information. If you go to markforge.com slash security, we have a, a published white paper on our approach. And I would love for everyone to go take a look and see how we work hard every day to make sure as you're on this journey, you're getting the capabilities that you need to power this digital forge, but also that you can trust uh, that your data and, and information will be secure and protected. Thank you. Uh, Michael, I think you're muted. Thanks, Ted. Uh, so that's a great overview of kind of how the platform is architected. Uh, I want to turn over to Tom to talk a little bit about actually uh, what uh, different hardware products make up uh, this uh, platform and also some of the materials that work with it. All right. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Ted. Um, so, yeah, you know, as mentioned, you know, a key element of the digital supply chain is, is the hardware materials uh, that ultimately create your parts. Um, and so what Mark Forge, what we offer, um, many of you may know this, some of you may be new tuning in. Um, it's a full range of, of product products, hardware products that produce kind of functional high strength uh, parts. And so we have our composites product line, um, really on the professional low end element of that, we have the Mark II really flagshipping uh, the professional desktop line. Uh, and so uh, we have some Onyx One and Onyx Pro, which are at lower price points. Um, but this is kind of the best entry into really high performance um, parts that can replace metal in many situations. Uh, and then still within composites, but on the industrial range, we have the X7, which is our flagship industrial platform. Um, by going up to the X7 and the industrial line in general, you get you know, larger print size, large, uh, faster print speeds, more accuracy, uh, more consistency, more reliability. Um, and both of these products we've been shipping since 2016 with a revision in there. Um, and so when we, when we look up at that map of where many of our customers are and how many customers we have around the world, you know, we have, we have 10,000 plus of these composite machines out in the world. Uh, so they're very much battle tested and um, being used in a lot of functional use cases. And then we have our metal, metal product line. Uh, so the Metal X system, which uh, debuted in 2017, and then uh, two, two different sintering furnaces, depending on throughput needs. So we uh, first launched Sinter 1 uh, a couple of years ago, and then last year introduced Sinter 2. So this uh, higher volume, uh, higher throughput sintering furnace um, that makes the economics better for those applications where customers are, are getting a lot of, uh, you know, use out of their Metal X and transitioning maybe from, you know, one or two Z prototypes to um, some more end-use use cases uh, like we've, we've highlighted in some of our case studies. 
Next. And functional, ma functional materials. So on the composites product line, uh, we have a mix of, uh, you know, we call microfiber composite materials. Uh, so we have onyx and onyx FR. Uh, we also have a nylon material and then a range of continuous carbon fibers, right? And, and what's unique about our process is that we take those continuous fibers and we embed them into the part as it's printing to create really metal replacement strength parts. And so there's a bit of a diagram on the right so you can see how um, our slicer software is able to selectively uh, place these fibers in part in sections of the part that really reinforce their strength um, efficiently. Uh, and so, you know, we find, I mean, these, these are, you know, this is our core material set. Like uh, we, we sell, uh, you know, tons of composite materials and printers and many of the use cases, one is for, for end use parts. So co companies, uh, many small companies will be using these for their actual product that they're selling to customers. So as you think about a digital supply chain, um, the resiliency that you get from, from that type of production arrangement is pretty powerful. Um, but also too, I mean, these are, these are products and materials that are being used in tooling applications. So you know, also very relevant to the digital supply chain when there are disruptions and manufacturers need to pivot to producing a different component very quickly. Like we've seen some manufacturers pivoting to, to making ventilators uh, that historically made auto parts. Having the right tooling in place is really essential to making that, that switch rapidly. Um, and then on the metal side, so we have 17.4 uh, pH, uh, which is really our, our kind of workhorse material, stainless steel, uh, used for prototyping, um, end use applications, tooling as well. There's an end effector in this image, a uh, robotic end effector for, for pick and place. Um, we also have Inconel 625. So this is a nickel based super alloy that has an incredibly high heat and chemical resistance and corrosion resistance. Uh, and then we also have a range of tool steels. So H13, D2, and A2. Uh, and so these are these tools steels are primarily being used for, for tooling applications. So you can see there's um, you know, press break die, punch. Um, and so when we talk about being able to rapidly pivot uh, your manufacturing line, ha having the ability to print these materials and centering them and essentially being able to get new, you know, metal tooling in a one or two day turnaround without being, without dependency on, on, um, you know, a job shop, uh, kind of machine shops is, is pretty powerful. And then on the far right, uh, copper. So this is our most recent introduction to our metal portfolio. Uh, copper, extremely high electrical conductivity, extremely high thermal conductivity, uh, and notoriously difficult to machine and work. And so, um, you know, we found really interesting applications so far, uh, or our customers, I should say, have found really interesting applications in, uh, you know, for things like bus bars or weld shanks or uh, induction coils or heat treating induction coils. Uh, and so, you know, the ability to 3D print this, you know, very, ver very uh, versatile, very capable material in a variety of shapes without having to machine it uh, is something that a lot of, of our customers are taking advantage of now. Uh, and so with that, I think Trip is going to say a bit about applications. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Right. Next slide. So wanted to cover two distinct examples for supply chain optimization where 3D printing is driving incredible value. Um, both of these are great supply chain solutions with dramatically different spheres of influence. So one of the, I guess, most impressive global supply chain operations out there is the US military. Um, or any DOD group around the world. Being far from home with a wide range of deployed resources and limited ability to deliver new parts, replacement parts, all of that is really driving in renewed interest for on-demand, on-location part availability. You never know what's gonna break when you deploy. You don't have the ability to bring a spare of every single thing that could possibly go wrong. So what do you do? You use statistics, you're analyzing what's gone wrong in the past, anticipating what might go wrong in the future, anticipating your part needs and stocking accordingly. Great. But similar examples too in offshore oil or uh, you know remote mining, things like that, offshore fishing, you've got a closed environment. You need to be able to provide a solution as quick as possible. It's a mission critical application. That's when you get a $10 wrench getting a $20,000 helicopter ride to solve a problem. The ability to deploy resources locally that can solve problems at the source of need is really why 3D printing has been such a dramatic and powerful tool for these 
operations in tightly constrained supply chain situations. Um, given that you don't know what's going to go wrong, the ability to have a platform that can be trusted to be repeatable, reliable, to deliver results, despite maybe not an engineering approach to the solution. It's a guy in the field trying to fix a door. It's building a spare part. So having a platform you can trust combined with that connected ecosystem of a secure software platform to be able to pull validated designs down anywhere in the world and print that part on demand is becoming extraordinarily powerful. Um, you've got people deployed in areas where a plane is down $70,000 of, you know, landing gear assembly or fix the part that's broken. It turns out it's pennies in material. The guy can quickly CAD something up, print and get that plane back in the air. The dollar value there is almost incalculable, but the ability to problem solve at the point of issue is uh, really what's unlocking here. It's not that we're giving them the ability to make wrenches. It's that we're giving them the ability to make whatever they need when they need it. And that's where the extreme value comes from. Um, so tons of examples here that can be shared, but the biggest impact is the ability to not have to anticipate the need. It's to be able to have a tool that can be able to adapt and be applied to a wide variety of problems that maybe weren't planned for. Next slide. And this is the entire other end of the spectrum. It's not a wrench. This is a part that's hundred years old. It no longer exists. The vendor no longer exists, the drawings, the tooling, everything's gone. What do you do? In this case, they're restoring a classic car and a carburetor assembly was damaged and destroyed. Casting was unable to be recreated. Internal geometry made it extraordinarily complex to machine. Not something that you could really build via other mechanisms or at least not cost effectively. Printing, again, the ability to take a raw material and create a wide variety of parts on demand in this case, provides a solution where the broken part can be scanned, reverse engineered and repaired, recreated. So in this case, they actually used our Onyx system for a very quick turnaround, low cost prototype to ensure that dimensional accuracy was correct. It could be fitted and used appropriately. That shortened the cycle time there. All of a sudden you iterated and had a part ready to test in days. Then the ability to print in functional metal with the same tolerance and the same accuracy to be able to put that on and have a functional metal piece replacing what is unavailable 100 years later is allowing customers again to be able to pivot with agility and solve these issues as they present themselves you don't know what the next car is going to come into your shop looking like but having the ability to without outside support be able to identify that issue design a solution and put it into practice almost immediately is an unbelievable advantage when it comes to shortening supply chain and getting you back to what you're intending to do as a company, which is delivering value to customers. In this case, getting the car back on the road. Awesome. Thank, thanks, Trip. Um, so some super cool examples here. Um, and you'll note uh, that you can find these on our website. So uh, these have been published. If you want to go read more about uh, any of these examples, uh, please please head over to markforge.com. And um, I, I love love the, the the range there from uh, for sort of uh, from the military and an advanced uh, forward base to like making parts for uh, objects that are more than hundred years old. Uh, super cool examples. Um, I want to go over to Jem uh, to give us uh, some other uh, examples of customers uh, using uh, MarkForge technology to assist with uh, supply chain issues. Perfect. Thanks very much, Michael. Um, and again, a bit like what Trip was saying earlier, uh, you'll see this video on the right hand side. This is a, a metal cutting tool uh, used in conventional um, sort of uh, machine shops, as you'll probably see. Uh, the unit on the left is actually the part itself uh, using some black carbide inserts, which basically are obviously the hard wearing tip. Uh, and I'll bring your attention to the small holes, which are actually opposite the black carbide tips, which basically inject coolant uh, just in front of the actual workpiece. So thank you, Michael, for uh, repeating that. So you can actually see the part working. Um, I think trying to sort of bring together what um, Tom and Ted and what Tripp are saying is business continuity. The ability to actually continue with your manufacturing despite everything else that's going on around you. I think that ability to be able to pivot very quickly is what additive can bring to the party. And certainly with regards to what we see here, 
if you actually look at the business case that actually Goering put together, they actually decided to actually purchase this technology on the basis of rapid prototyping. And as a consequence, they, they really did see some big benefits of cutting down the supply chain down from several months lead time down to literally several weeks. But what they also found was actually that the tooling that they produced actually outperformed the conventionally produced tooling. Now, the fascinating thing behind this is that what that allowed them to do is to be able to actually then produce this part to outperform their original and meant that actually rather than just for rapid prototyping and early production, they actually covered that initial production phase right the way through to almost volume production, meaning that they could stave off the time when they actually needed to invest in tooling themselves. So de-risking your business, desensitizing your business to outside influences, the way that you could actually then control your business internally, not relying on external forces and external influences. I mean, for example, just let's go back to COVID for a second, visors. You probably never really 3D print visors actually in the real world under normal circumstances, but these aren't normal circumstances. <laughs> you know, you have to pivot around the technology that's available at that time and the ability to print locally at the point of need, which is exactly what the trip was talking about. The ability to do that on your own factory floor is a really, really powerful tool. So uh, just to give you an idea, so Goering is an 8,000 employee uh, strong uh, business with 70 different sites across 48 different countries. And they're starting to deploy this technology globally. So you can imagine now that they've got a fleet of printers which could actually then deploy across business, across geographies, and not have the worry or issues that you get with regards to the more convoluted supply chain systems that you have in the marketplace. On to the next slide. Right, I really wanted to pivot around something a little bit less uh, sort of technical from the machining side of things, actually onto a glass cleaning system. Uh, Clenaware, this is a really, really interesting company. Uh, a small to medium-sized enterprise, which I think a lot of companies can actually relate to. Um, this fascinating story behind this, this company has been around for some, some decades now, and they have a, a range of, of parts, which we would class now as legacy. So effectively you've got, print, uh, sorry, you've got uh, systems in field that require to be serviced. Uh, they had a situation with one of their glass washers actually going down and as a consequence they needed a spare part. The spare part was actually made 15 to 20 years ago and their uh, nominated tooling supplier had actually lost the tool. So they'd actually invested in this tool 20 odd years ago and the tooling had now disappeared. So what do you do? You either reinvest in the same tooling which is going to cost you $20,000 or you invest in a printer to actually make the part. And the interesting thing is this stepwise motion from the MD decided to print the part instead, suddenly now realized that basically this part meant that they could actually print as and when they needed. So they didn't actually have to hold stock, which then meant they didn't have to order a minimum quantity of 500 pieces or 1,000 pieces. I think the story actually really starts to evolve when the R&D team got hold of it and realized that their washers actually had certain limitations in the process and by effectively iterating upon the design, they actually managed to actually improve on that design and actually then started to actually then push these design improvements out into the field much quicker. What this meant was that they hadn't got to involve exterior forces, exterior supply chains for them to be able to come in to actually iterate on these designs. It simplified the whole process, literally from design to print. And as a consequence of that, this simplification of supply chains has actually meant their business is more agile. They can focus on the business need that they have at this moment in time and can actually focus on growing their own business needs. And as a consequence, what they've done, they've now got a fleet of 10 printers of which they pivoted some of those printers towards the COVID situation actually here locally in the UK. And they actually managed to do this in a toolingless way. Now, most old guys like me who come from engineering, my dad was a tool maker, to hear these words of tooling less production sounds a little bit like a horror story, but the reality is it just taking tooling out of the whole discussion process means that tooling less production is one way of making your system more agile, more robust, and more independent from outside, outside and external influences. So I'll hand back to Michael right now. Great, awesome, Thank, thanks, Jim. Uh, yeah, and again, super cool to see kind of the, the spread of applications here. Uh, and again, uh, as you saw there, um, the, uh, the, the Goering uh, cutting tool, if you want to learn more about that, uh, head on over to our website. We have a case study and uh, lots of pictures and information about it. Um, also, if you have additional questions uh, that you'd like to ask, uh, please keep throwing those into the, uh, the Zoom chat. We will uh, we'll answer those uh, in a little bit once we uh, get through a few more of the presentation parts. Um, 
Um, next up, I'd like to, to go over, uh, we're going to talk with Adam for a second. Um, you know, it's important to note, right, at Mark Forged, uh, not, not only we, uh, you know, sort of uh, very excited about uh, 3D printing technology, uh, we are a manufacturer ourselves. Uh, we, we obviously need to build, uh, build the printers, build the materials that we, uh, that we create for, for all of you. And uh, we thought it'd be awesome to learn a little bit from uh, our in-house uh, resident who manages uh, our supply chain and helps to make sure that everything uh, is able to keep operating and really drives the company forward. So um, I'd like to go over to Adam to get uh, some, some insight into uh, what, what the last couple of months have been like uh, for you over here. Nope, you, uh, you're muted, Adam. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Thank you, Michael. Um, yeah, it's, I would... Uh, say the last few months have uh, definitely been a, a bit of a challenge to test our metal, if you will. Um, you know, I've been doing this for over 20 plus years. Um, and, you know, supply chain is a concept that, you know, it's been around for a while, right? And Michael, I think you eloquently put it earlier. It's it's the overarching theme of the different uh, steps that uh, basically get your product, get you what you need when you need it. Um, and everyone's need, I find is, is a little different when it comes to supply chain because not everyone's business is the same. But I think there's some overarching concepts of predictability and reliability we want within our supply chains. And there's a lot of content, there's a lot of subject matter expertise on, on the topic. And you, know, you look at what the landscape for a supply chain was prior to this year. And in a lot of ways, you know, we're, we're not, we weren't massively changing the landscape from a supply chain perspective because we were fine tuned at this point. We got a lot of it figured out. Um, and this year has been a, a definite um, eye-opening experience. Um, it, it's really tested the robustness of an organization's supply chain. Do we have what we need? Do we have where we need it? Um, the turbulence in, in the market and the supply chains that historically were robust have been I think more than well documented. And it's uh, really caused us as an industry to reassess, you know, where are we, where are we able to remove the unpredictability, um, to smooth the fluctuation on demand, um, to create solutions that can overcome ambiguity within the markets. Um, you know, we, we, we've got a lot of gray space right now into what's happening. You know, one of, a lot of the questions that kept me up at night, you know, can we get what we need? Are we going to be able to support the business? Uh, do we have the <clears throat> proper stock in the proper locations? You know, are we going to have the ability to get what we need through our, our manufacturing process? Um, or are we overstocked and we don't necessarily have the demand we need there? Uh, for us, it, it was really a lot of challenging questions to, and, and instances where we had to assess do we have what we need in place? You know, we had to have a conversation internally about um, parts and dependencies on foreign suppliers to make sure that we could still manufacture our printers. Um, and there's a ton of risk there. You know, cost to serve is another one of that. You know, I think uh, Trip, you hit the nail on the head there. You got a ten dollar um, wrench, but you take a twenty thousand dollar helicopter ride to get it to where you need to be. We were running into, into some of those situations where our legacy solutions um, just weren't putting us in the spot from a value equation to be able to support our customers. Uh, loss of air freight, air freight uh, capacity around the world. Um, we had quoted costs going up 40 plus percent to try to support business in Australia and having to find new and creative ways to, <clears throat> to be able to support our customers and uh, be able to find the solutions to keep us, keep us afloat. Next slide, please. So some of the key learnings that we we've come come to come to understand here, um, and I won't get into it all of it, but I think the overarching thing here is resiliency. You have to have solutions in place within your supply chain to to keep you agile, to keep maintain that continuity, um, and having having the understanding that legacy you know legacy solutions sometimes can still take risk. Tried, tried and true solutions in an ever uh, evolving landscape may have worked 15, 20 years ago, but maybe they're not as compelling as they were yesterday. Uh, you know, we, we use the, the printing solution and is been, how do I put this? It's been absolutely, um, a, you know, 
win winning situation for us in our filament factory. Uh, we, from a PM perspective, on our extrusion lines, you know, we've we've got a, a printer fleet there that is turning out parts at, on demand to be able to keep those those uh, those lines up and running. Um, you know, we, we've got to make sure that we're we're keeping lines going. Anything, you know, line down, money lost. Um, and then at the end of the day, you know, we've got to make sure there's some redundancy there. It can be your best friend. Um, you know, how do we, we can't control everything, but we want to be in a position that we can improve our position on what we can control um, to put us in the best position to be possible, uh, best position possible to be successful. You know, I think if, if I would leave, you know, the group here with any uh, parting thoughts, you know, you know, COVID's going to pass, you know, we don't know when or, or what the next challenge on the horizon is going to be, um, but will have a very real impact on businesses. Um, I think what we have a requirement responsibility to organizations do is take a hard look on where we do have opportunities to control our own destiny. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Adam. It's a great overview. And, um, you know, uh, a couple uh, extra shout outs. If you, if you actually want to see uh, some of the behind the scenes of our manufacturing operation, uh, you can hang out uh, on our website, on our resources page. We have a factory tour that we did uh, about a month or so ago. And like Adam mentioned, you can actually see some of the parts in there that we, we've printed uh, to help uh, sort of optimize uh, our own supply chains. So it's a good question we had here uh, in, the, in the Zoom chat. Um, as a 3D printing company, do you use your own technology uh, to, to fix supply chain challenges? And I think as, as Adam just mentioned, yeah. Um, and, and Adam, you want to add anything around that, just around that question? Yeah, it, it's a great question because you know, definitely we... we it would uh, we practice what we preach on that front. Um, you know, obviously, can we do it everywhere? No, um, but where we have the opportunity uh, and it makes sense, we definitely we look at that first. Um, you know, there there are times that you you have those one offs where it's like I don't need five hundred of these; I need four, and I only need four for the next two years. Um, and you know, we we want to look at that first. Hey, that's the first thing. This is our wheelhouse. This is our core competency. You know, what can we do to get us back in a position of being full bore and, and running um, our, our uh, machines and, and keeping our supply chain moving. If we can do that first and foremost, that's where we're gonna look first. And awesome. it's, it's been absolutely successful and you know, huge shout out, I would say to the product team to give us um, multiple uh, materials uh, for the varying applications. You know, it's, uh, it's proved very, very um, pivotal and successful for us to have those options. Um, if, if you know, I, we would still be successful if we didn't have the variety, but um, this just expands how, how frequently we can leverage our own solution. Yeah, really, really one, one more step of resiliency, redundancy, you know, the ability to have multiple paths to get to your solution. Um, you know, I think a lot of times uh, additive technology can be the most flexible, right? So it may not apply to every problem, but oftentimes uh, it's the, it's the first place you might try to see if you can fix a problem, which is uh, which is really cool to see. Um, so we have some time here for questions. Uh, and really, I want to, again, I want to encourage the audience. Uh, uh, we got a great set of people here from across the company. So, uh, you know, th throw your best shot at them. And let's see if you, if you can stump a, if stump a product manager. I think we'll give out some kind of award at the end. So uh, let's see what you can do here, guys. Um, starting on that. Um, we have some questions around, we saw earlier um, a example of a customer, uh, a job shop RPG that was doing a restoration of an old car. And as part of that process, you know, they have to figure out how to design this part that uh, doesn't exist anymore. Um, uh, Ted or Tom, uh, do you want to talk, or, or anyone on the, on the call, do you want to talk a bit about what that process would entail, kind of uh, reverse engineering the design of a part? Uh, how would you do that? Yeah, Tripp, you want to go ahead? Yeah, thanks, Michael. Um, so the technology of 3D scanning is developing quickly, sort of in line with the growth of CAD and 3D printing. Um, so accuracy is a bit of an open-ended question. You can get down into the micron range, everything goes up with cost, or you know, accuracy goes up with cost. But other things to consider when you are reverse engineering a part for RPG in this case, they had one carburetor assembly that was good, one that was broken. So they scanned the remaining one and were able to reverse engineer it that way. But when you're scanning, basically you are creating a point cloud. So approximating the 3D shape of a part with a variety of pinpoints of light or laser or you know, physical touches that uh, give a boundary for that geometry. Um, so when you do that, you are approximating a 
curved shape with a variety of facets. And the density of that point cloud, as well as the accuracy of each point, will determine the accuracy of your part. Uh, but that said, a part that may be intended to be perfectly flat would be scanned and approximated and have some deviation. So there is a, a balance of human interaction that can greatly streamline the process. If you look at something and know it's supposed to be flat, you don't care about the accuracy of your thing. You just know it's a flat panel. Um, so having the ability to override that and the software tools available to clean the scan data and make it into a usable functional solid body, uh, that's developing quickly as well. So it's, it's unfortunately not an easy answer of saying 3D scanning is this accuracy or you know, this accurate. It's more about 3D scanning being part of the technology combined with an engineer who knows what's going on and a set of calipers to actually create the best way to digitize that part. So in some cases it's scanning, other times it's measuring and just reverse engineering straight through CAD. Um, but it's developing quickly and is proving to be hugely useful. Awesome, thanks Trip. Uh, and yeah, if you, have, if you have questions about what that process would entail or maybe you have an application that you're looking to, uh, to work on, um, you know, please, please reach out to us. Uh, we're always you know, happy to help. Uh, would love to hear the kinds of parts you're looking to make uh, and see how we can help solve for you. Um, there's a, a question, follow-up question. We've been talking a bit about uh, scanning and sort of you know, the, uh, where that fits into the process in general. Uh, we have a question here noting that um, some of our printers uh, come with lasers uh, and, and scanning capabilities. Um, now, we know uh, at Mark Forge here, one of the things that we love to do is ship a product with uh, some hardware or sensors on it, and then over time use software to bring that functionality to life to make that better. Uh, but maybe, Ted, do you want to talk a little bit about um, sort of the, the role that that sensor plays uh, on our printer today uh, and just uh, what we might be thinking about in the future? Yeah, absolutely. So today uh, with our industrial series printers, the X7 comes with a, a very high accuracy laser micrometer uh, built into the print head itself. Uh, primarily what that's been used for historically is actually what we call adaptive bed leveling, right? So before you start a print, we'll run the print head around and scan your specific print bed and make sure that we have a profile of the print bed, um, of the print bed surface. And we can account for in software any deviations uh, that might be so that you, your part winds up being as requested. Um, we also have some tooling in Iger to allow for layer by layer scanning of parts, right? So we can, we can pause, we can scan a layer and we can generate an image of that layer in Iger. Um, in future state, we'll, you can imagine we'll be expanding upon the level of detail and, and the, the usefulness um, of these scans uh, into more 3D models and, and more um, iterative correction. Um, but those will be for future webinars. Uh, so stay tuned, but there's lots of value in that laser today from a usability, repeatability, reliability perspective. Uh, what it really does today is it makes that X7 print as close to the same parts across you know, any printer as, as is possible. Cool, uh, th thanks, Ted. Uh, yeah, so uh, stay, stay tuned for uh, cool things you can do with lasers uh, by, by adding software to the printers. So yeah, uh, re really, really neat. The idea that you can buy, buy this product and all of a sudden uh, software is gonna come out and make it uh, do even more cool stuff. Um, we have a question back for Jem um, around uh, that cutting tool, that milling tool that we saw. Uh, what material was that printed in? Uh, and um, did you think that was possible when, uh, when, when, when that application was first proposed? Did we, did we learn anything interesting about the capabilities there? That's a great question. Yeah, I mean, certainly from my side, to answer it simply, it's H13 tool steel, which is actually part of our uh, range of materials, but actually the, remember it's the body itself. What they actually are doing, Goering are the largest PCD, that's polycrystalline diamond producers on the planet. These guys actually make PCD in sheets. You then cut the sheets out into small little inserts. These inserts are then actually then bonded or glued or effectively welded onto the surface or brazed onto the surface of the H13. So the H13 is actually the carrier for the ultimate tooltip. And the thing answering Papish's comment there is that my father and myself actually, again, brought up on subtractive manufacturing. And effectively, one of the things that you have with that is the issue with regards to coolant and the way that the coolant actually enters the cutting flue or enters the cutting area to sweep the area clean, free for the next cut to effectively occur. And what we notice is that by effectively creating what is in essence a a coolant pathway, which is actually heli uh, helical in its design up through the body, which cannot be produced by any other means. So EDM and other technologies cannot produce this. It can only be done additively. 
and then having the infill on the part itself, lightweighting the tool so that it can spin up quicker, spin down quicker, meaning lower loads on the motor, which means that basically you can run at higher feeds and speeds, means ultimately for the end customer, higher productivity. So it really is a win-win scenario right the way through, but it just needed that leap of faith to try it. And as a consequence, as you say, you know, from our side of things, it's very much a case of once you're in there and you have that design in your mind, it's amazing actually how this just literally infiltrates the whole business. And I think Paper should agree from my side of things as well that you see this so many times that uh, uh, one of our bits of kit is actually bought on a particular ROI. And then suddenly the secondary benefits and the other things with regards to reduction in the supply chain, complexity in your business, the ability to focus on what's really important, which is actually making money, is what it's all about. And effectively, that is why additive, I think, is such a, a revolutionary technology in these current times. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, thanks, Jim, for that sort of background there. And yeah, I think you know the, um, the you know one of our sayings is just that the, the 3D printer is really the most flexible tool in your tool belt, right? So um, you know when you run into these sort of open questions, uh, you you discover all kinds of interesting ways to applying it as you use the technology. So super cool to see what people are doing. Um, we have a question here from Philippe in the audience uh, that I'll send over to Adam um, uh, about uh, where where do we uh, where do we produce our materials? Uh, what are our production facilities, and um, uh, do we have redundancy around the globe, or how do we handle that? I'm sorry, you said last part again. Yeah, the uh, first question is yeah, wh where the where's our production facility located, and then um, what do we have other facilities around the globe, or what do we do uh, for redundancy purposes? Um, you know, with with our production materials. Yeah, it's a great question. So we do uh, manufacture 100% of our uh, filaments in house today. Um, we all that manufacturing is done here in the greater Boston area um, near our headquarters. Um, from a facility perspective globally, we're, we're in that um, you know, growth stage too. And so right now we have um, all of our manufacturing is done here for the most part in the the greater Boston area in the Northeast. Um, but we do have multiple distribution centers and fulfillment centers um, around the world. Uh, right now we have a facility here in the Northeast. We have a facility in the UK. We're bringing online a, a new EMEA hub in the Netherlands very shortly. Uh, and then we will be looking to shift our focus to APAC and look to bring some distribution nodes uh, closer to the, the markets and channels there. Awesome. Th thanks, Adam, for that background. And again, if you if you want to see a little bit of uh, what's been going on in that production facility uh, located in, in the town of Billerica here in the Massachusetts area, please check out our website. Uh, got lots of cool cool interviews of the folks that run the plant and uh, get to see a lot of the technology and the, and the tools there. Um, Tom, I have uh, we have two questions here uh, around some of the materials that we print with and their properties. Um, one is the uh, the temperature that the Onyx uh, FR material is rated for. Uh, and then the other is we received a question uh, before uh, the, the uh, today's event started around the uh, UV resistance of Onyx parts in general. So maybe you could uh, answer both of those for us. Sure, yeah. Um, so around the heat resistance of Onyx, Onyx FR, um, one, one test that's very common in industry that we use is uh, called heat deflection temperature. Uh, and that's basically a way of measuring when the really the strength properties of that material start to break down at what temperature. And um, those are both rated for 145 C. Um, so you can actually find, we have a material data sheet on our website that has kind of that, that data along with other useful data on our information that I'd um, recommend taking a look at. Um, but for both of those materials, 145C, uh, and then all those parts can also be reinforced with uh, our full range of, of uh, continuous fibers. We have a high strength, high temp fiberglass, which is, is rated up to 150C. So that's kind of the, the, the threshold. We, we have, uh, you know, examples, I'm sure Jem and, and Trip I've seen them as well of customers using them at even higher temperatures for, you know, a limited time frame or things like that. But in terms of uh, the heat deflection temperature temp, it's around 145C. Um, and then the question around UV resistance. So we haven't done any uh, specific UV resistance testing. Um, I would say like our materials are based on a nylon 6, nylon 6.6 six type of uh, polymer. And so, you know, everything Every, the way that those materials behave with uh, UV degradation is the same as or similar to how our material should behave. Um, that said, UV resistance generally penetrates about a millimeter through this type of material. And so, you know, if, if strength is a concern, embedding continuous carbon fiber or other fibers into the part is one way to 
retain that stiffness and um, retain that strength, even if a part's um, going to be exposed to, uh, you know, UV, UV rays. Cool. Uh, thank, thanks, Tom, for uh, sort of the updates uh, on both of those. And again, if you have uh, technical questions or other questions, you can keep adding them uh, to the, the chat here. Uh, and we'll also uh, try to follow up afterwards. So if you leave a question here, we'll try to try to get in contact with you to answer those. Um, we have uh, additional question that came in uh, before the event, uh, also on, on sort of Onyx. I'm going to throw this one over, I think, to Jem. Um, but uh, we, we have, a, we have a, a customer out there who's been using uh, Onyx for making uh, pneumatic fixtures for uh, robotic applications and are looking for some ways to uh, make the parts uh, hold air pressure a bit better. Uh, do you have any recommended settings or post-processing or other things that you could be doing with uh, an Onyx part to allow it to hold uh, uh, air under pressure? Awesome. Um, obviously, Trip and I can answer this question so together, but um, the way that we would generally work actually in Europe would be to, one of the key aspects of our technology is the ability to pause a print. And if you already have our technology, you'll know the benefits of doing that, being able to embed hardware actually into the body of the product itself. But equally, rather than embedding nuts, bolts and other sort of traditional metallic hardware, it's very, very straightforward to actually then embed what is effectively an, a, a typical pipe, a pneumatic pipe or a pneumatic uh, cis, uh, uh, fixture or, or fitting into the design itself and simply print straight over the top. So typically with regards to high pressure environments, typically for hydraulic and pneumatics, uh, that is always a way that you can actually use to try and embed it. Uh, Trip, did you want to just embellish that a little bit more with regards to maybe other sort of post-processing technologies that you've used in the U.S.? Sure. Um, so addressing porosity is definitely an interesting issue. Um, when it comes to pressure holding capabilities, you are also highly uh, impacted by the exposed surface area on the inside. So when you print a standard infill part, any small porosity in there will start to vent pressure from the pressure channel into the infill and then your uh, I guess projected area goes way up and your part will delaminate. So printing solid is one way to help. Small, small channels is good. So if you're looking for an actuator but not high flow through it, that can help. That way the uh, I guess proportionate force within the part is much lower. Also using um, you know either a two-part epoxy or something like that can be used to coat and seal the part. If you really want to get into it, vacuum impregnation is good. Um, and we also are trialing some third party solutions to effectively vapor polish and seal up any surface porosity and remove layer lines, that sort of thing. Um, I think any combination of those solutions that myself and Jim just portrayed should address your problem. Um, feel free to reach out to, uh, either someone here, or we can follow up offline afterwards. I'd like to get into it and solve it for you. Awesome. Thanks, Trip. Uh, yeah. So showing off again, like uh, yeah, these are great, great questions. Uh, and we, we have a team here with lots of expertise in, in how to solve them. So um, uh, if we don't answer your question here today, like, please definitely reach out and we would love to talk to you uh, on ways of solving for your applications. Uh, we have a uh, sort of a similar follow up question back for Trip uh, from Stacy in the audience. Um, uh, could you point uh, towards a resource perhaps uh, on our website where uh, we can talk a bit about the required ventilation and maybe some of the EHS requirements for the X7 and the Metal X? Sure, absolutely. Um, so on our website, we have facilities guides and any other um, you know, safety or EHS documentation necessary that your in-house people might be interested in reviewing. Also, working with us directly, we'd be more than happy to understand a bit more about your application and the requirements or restrictions you have to meet. Um, our stuff is widely used in almost every manufacturing instance out there. So I have no question or no concern about not meeting your requirements. It's just, let's make sure we can uh, get you the information you need. So again, reach out directly and we're happy to work with you on that. Awesome. Uh, there's a question here that's come through the chat uh, that uh, that I can quickly answer, which is, um, do, does, does Mark Forge have technicians that can come on uh, on site uh, and fix the printer if required, uh, or does it have to be uh, shipped back? Uh, the, the first thing to note is um, 
printers are, are quite reliable uh, and redundant, so um, we, we don't often uh, find the need to really bring them back to, to fix them. Um, there are a series of things you can do to service the machines. Uh, and the great thing is we have a, a, a network of our partners across the world operating today in more than 60 countries. Uh, so when you uh, work with us and were to purchase a printer from us, you will be connected with uh, one of these partners. Uh, they will help you with all the things such as installation, service, uh, on-site support. And so really they're a, a great uh, ability uh, and really, really knowledgeable about how our technology works and can uh, be, be, your, be the printer's best friend in the field. So anytime you run into an issue, uh, there is someone available in your area who can come out and take a look. Again, it doesn't happen that often, but, uh, but it is something we definitely offer uh, along with a variety of uh, support plans as well that are part of the printer. Um, we have a few minutes left. Uh, there's a great question here um, from, uh, from a, a member of the audience around, uh, uh, he's a, a mechanical engineering student and is looking to uh, start a small workshop uh, to allow some folks to start uh, getting experience with uh, 3D printers. Um, and I think, uh, Tripp, you had some ideas here. Uh, any, any tips or suggestions on kind of where to start or uh, what, what you might want to add into a, a lab like that to get some experience with this technology? Sure. So in a workshop environment, it's really going to depend on what your intended applications are. 3D printing is a variety of tools. You need to use the right tool for the right job. So if you're prototyping jewelry, you may be getting into a small SLA machine. If you're looking for functional tooling and prototypes and things that are a bit more industry ready, then Mark Forge is definitely the way to go. What I would recommend is that you engage our team in the field, our sales teams out there. Our best interest is your best interest. We wanna solve your problem in a way that makes sense. If our technology isn't the right fit, we'll tell you so. Uh, but if it is, we're happy to give you the best recommendation to address kind of that biggest value wedge of the problems you're looking to solve. And then other complementary technologies in the industry are happy to fit in in the other spots. Yeah, and I, I love that answer because, um, you know, uh, we make what we think are awesome uh, printers and, and an awesome platform, but it's not applicable in every single in instance or situation. There are many other types of technologies depending on your use case. Uh, if you're trying to start out in a small workshop, there, there are maybe lower end machines that are available. Uh, if you're trying to do very specific kinds of applications, maybe maybe our machines aren't, and we're happy to point you towards the ones that are. Uh, what we want to do here is really uh, teach people about uh, all the ways that you can use this technology to solve engineering problems and fix supply chains. Um, and we want we want you to solve the problem. Uh, we, you know, we, we, you know, it'd be great if you buy one of our machines, but it's also great if you buy some other machine and solve the problem. That's really what we're all about here. Uh, and um, you know, we've, we've hit the end of our hour. Uh, so I really want to thank uh, the panel for taking some time out of their, their busy days uh, to join us uh, and offer some insights around um, what we've been doing at Mark Forge to think about uh, our supply chain and supply chains around the world and how uh, technology from uh, Additive and from our digital forge can help to solve these problems. So once again, thank you for the time. Thank you for the audience for your time here today. Um, please uh, follow up with us if there are any questions you have that we didn't answer. Uh, please visit our website for additional information. And also, if you'd like to see some of the recordings from previous events in the series, uh, where we talk with companies such as uh, Siemens uh, and Dana about what they've been doing with additive technology across their supply chains as well. So uh, once again, uh, thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Uh, please let us know if we can help you at all.